Hello, my name is David Higgins and I'm a lecturer in English Literature at the University of Leeds. The title of this podcast is Language and Meaning in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Now I'm aware that that's a rather vague and open title, but I hope as the podcast continues you'll see the logic of it and the way in which I'm really trying to focus on the relationship between form and content in this poem. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is a poem that I've been fascinated with since I first read it at school. But it's also a text that I've always found rather difficult. And one of the purposes of this podcast is to think about the challenge of the poem and how we might try and tackle it. It's also designed to give you a sense of the study of literature at university. And one of the things I do in this podcast is to engage with the work of other critics and theorists. This engagement with previous research, really regardless of the discipline, is a key aspect of university study. One initial challenge of the poem is that Coeridge made extensive revisions to it after it was first published. So there are, in effect, several different versions of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. I'm going to focus on the first version, published in Lyrical Ballads in 1798, though I will refer at one point to a later version of the poem. The first version contains a lot of archaic language, that is, language that was old-fashioned even at the time that Coeridge wrote the poem. So I'll say something about the poem's language and how we might deal with it. What makes the poem particularly fascinating for me is that lots of strange things happen in it that aren't really explained. Its mysteriousness has encouraged critics to read it symbolically, that is, to read what happens in the poem, the particular events of the poem, as somehow representing some broader facet of human experience. And it's significant, I think, that the mariner is never actually named. That encourages us to read him as a type or a symbol of something more than just one person. On the slide, you'll see a list of what I've identified as different critical approaches to the poem. The first one is displaced autobiography. And by that, I mean people have read it in terms of Coeridge's own life history and seen the ancient mariner as a a version of Coeridge, sort of projected into this strange universe. Another reading is of it as a religious story of sin and redemption. And you'll be aware that the poem contains lots of Christian imagery, and there's a certain logic to that interpretation. Another way of looking at the poem I've called existential parable, and by that I mean a story about a human being adrift in a strange, terrifying, possibly meaningless universe. Those three approaches, I suppose, were perhaps most prevalent in the mid-20th century, Um, but they still have a certain power now, and often, of course, critics or different critical approaches will use more than one of those ways of looking at the text. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. A more recent way in which the poem's been understood is as a text that self-consciously meditates on its own nature as a text and its own place in the history of interpretation. And critics who take this line tend to emphasise later versions of the poem and the way in which Coleridge revised it in a very self-conscious fashion. I've listed three other approaches that I suppose could all come under the rubric of contextualisation thinking about the poem in terms of revolutionary politics, or in terms of the slave trade, or in terms of imperial expansion. All of these were important issues at the end of the 18th century when Coleridge was writing. And Coleridge himself was very sort of politically aware and politically engaged. So there is a certain amount of evidence for being able to link this, you know, ostensibly rather abstract and mysterious poem to a quite grounded historical reality. The final version on the list is perhaps the most recent approach to poem, and this is as an ecological text. And by ecological, I mean a poem concerned with the relationship between human beings, the natural world, and perhaps with a more sort of broader environmental theme. Coeridge was an enormously well-read, intellectually and politically engaged man, and the poem distills a lot of his ideas and concerns of the period. So perhaps it's not surprising that there are a wide range of viable interpretations of it. I'm going to focus on the ecological version of the poem, but that's not to say that other readings are necessarily excluded by my approach. I've been thinking about The Ancient Mariner and teaching it for quite a few years, but I only recently read an ecological approach to it by the critic James McCusick, and this was just a few weeks ago. So, I mean, that in itself might suggest a way in which academics are engaged in a process of research that a text that I'm very familiar with and I've taught quite a lot is still something I'm thinking about and rethinking during the course of my career. So if I was to give this podcast in 10 years' time, it might be quite different. And if I'd given it five years ago, it might well have been quite different as well. McCusick argues that Coeridge was an ecological thinker 
in that he emphasised the deep interconnectedness between different organisms within the natural world. And he tried to overcome a sense of alienation between human beings and nature. In this reading, the ancient mariner's shooting of the albatross works as a sort of symbol of human technological aggression against the natural world. The destruction of the albatross, as you know, precipitates other terrible events. And Mikusik particularly emphasises the decay that surrounds the ancient mariner after he's done this. The very deeps did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. We might note that the world's oceans are currently in a state of environmental crisis. And one of the consequences of overfishing and changes to the chemical balance of the seas caused by human activity is an increased prevalence of jellyfish and toxic algae. So in fact, the seas are, as we speak, becoming slimier. I also discovered when researching this lecture that most species of albatross are in severe decline due to human activity. So we might see the rhyme of the ancient mariner, if it is an ecological poem, as a rather prescient one, one that actually looks forward to environmental degradation in the future. I do quite like McCusick's argument about the poem. I think it's very well thought out and sort of well evidenced in the course of his, his book. Um, but I think there's a problem with it, which I'll come on to later. What's good about his discussion for me is that unlike quite a lot of the poem's other critics, he actually thinks hard about its language. He doesn't just work with the ideas or the content, he thinks about its form as well. And that's something I think that most university study of English literature really emphasises, that we can't just treat texts as containing you know, characters, events, themes and so on. They actually, their form, the way in which they're written is really, really important. McCusick, as you'll see from the slide, presents the idea of what he calls an ecolect, a sort of language or way of writing that seeks to emphasise the organic relationships that make up the natural world. According to McCusick, Coe is conceived of language as a living thing, an integral organic system that can be cultivated by the poet for maximum diversity, either through the coinage of new words or the recovery of archaic ones. So McCusick sees the rhyme of the ancient mariner as a sort of linguistic habitat. When Coeridge took out most of the archaic words in later versions, McCusick thinks, of, thinks that he made it less dense, less diverse, less interesting, and therefore actually worked against its ecological theme. Now, this is a very complex point that McCusick's made, making, because he's making a point that relates the language of the poem to what he sees of, as its ecological content. And so I'm just going to pick out a particular example to try and, try and make the point a bit clearer. The 1798 version of the poem, that is the poem that was originally published, contains a number of words that even in Courage's time were considered old-fashioned and archaic. And in fact the poem was criticised quite a lot for this, and that may be why he took them out in later versions. Many of the archaic words that Courage uses are associated with traditional ballads. A ballad is a popular form of poetry that tells a story and often has a sort of particular metrical form, a particular rhythm. And the rhyme of the ancient mariner really fits into that. It is, among other things, a sort of reimagining of an old ballad. So there are ballad terms in there. There are also terms specific to seafaring, such as swooned and weft. And there are also terms associated with older British poets like Chaucer. McCusick picks out the word lavrock, from which the modern English lark derives. Now, Lavrock comes at a very strange moment in the poem, and actually McCusick doesn't really contextualise it and doesn't really engage with this moment. It happens when the dead crew, who have been possessed by spirits, are piloting the ship, and it just comes after there's been the ship's been sort of frozen in a state of stasis, and then the crew are, are revived in this rather macabre fashion, and the, the ship is able to move on and the poem is able to progress. And the mariner, in a sense, begins his movement to a sort of partial redemption when the crew become uh, revitalised, though the mariner's never fully redeemed in the poem because he has to continue passing from land to land and telling people his story, presumably for all eternity. But nonetheless, there is a shift at this moment in the poem in a sense of progress rather than stasis. Um, in, a, in a sort of strange and rather unexplained way, sweet sounds pass from the mouths of the crew, who of course are no longer people, but sort of um, rather zombie-like creatures, they pass from the mouths of the crew to the sun and come back. Um, and then you get this stanza. Sometimes a dropping from the sky, 
I heard the lavrock sing. Sometimes, or little birds that are, how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. I don't think these are literal birds. Um, what what Coach is trying to convey here is a strange sort of sense of spiritual musicality. And this jargoning is then compared to a lonely flute, an angel song, and a hidden brook. And these are the strange sounds, as I say, that are coming from the corpses of the crew. Jargoning in itself is an interesting word, and an archaic word, meaning something like chattering. But of course it also has a modern meaning, which I think Coge would have been aware of, jargon, i.e. a particular type of language. So we might think of the jargon of the ancient mariner, or certainly the jargon of this passage, as somehow representing the language of nature. McCusick suggests that the rock in Lavrock, the fact that Coge uses Lavrock rather than Lark, um, foreshadows a mariner's return to solid ground, and that the word itself is an example of the poem's jargon. It's a mixed, diverse language for McCusick that through its diversity allows it to examine the encounter between the human and the natural. I think I could add to McCusick's argument that it's important that the archaic words used in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner are English ones. The poem avoids the complex language of most 18th century English poetry. A lot of, not all, but a lot of um, poetry written in the 18th century is neoclassical. That is, it refers back to forms of writing associated with Greek and Roman culture and often alludes to classical myths, gods and goddesses, and so on. And to some extent, this makes that the writing associated with a, with a highly educated elite. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner doesn't do that, and in fact, the other poems of lyrical ballads very explicitly refuse to do that and try and write in a different sort of language that might be somewhat more accessible. And I think the, the, access, or the relatively accessible language of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, or at least the Englishness of that language, along with the fact that it can't be placed within a particular historical period because it has words from all kinds of periods, is, in a strange way, an attempt to make the poem more open and accessible. Even though the archaic language may seem distancing to us, maybe the point is that all readers, or certainly all contemporary readers, will find it equally strange. So it doesn't necessarily discriminate between readers in the way that um, a, a form of writing that had very specific allusions to classical myths that only the highly educated would have known, that does tend to discriminate against other readers. Whereas with the Rhyme and the Ancient Mariner, perhaps everybody is equally confused.